Well, for the first time in my adult life, I have to wear glasses to look at my slides. So this is a very, very memorable talk for me. When Dr. Gerber asked me to come and speak at Low Carb Denver, he gave me a challenge. He asked me to talk about a topic I've never talked about on, on social media or in a, in a talk itself. And so the insulin sensitive obese patient is something that I did a deep dive on. And I hope today that you're gonna learn some really good information, not only for the clinicians in the room, but also the lay public, so that you can be empowered to be able to help your patients. And also, if you yourself are struggling with some of these insulin sensitivity issues, you can get on top of them because it is reversible. Okay, when you go to do a um, evaluation of this talk, please note that when I started writing my talk, I realized that I had an over zealous ability to come up with lots of different learning objectives. I had to cut them back to three as opposed to five uh, in order to be able to keep to the time frame of 30 minutes. So today we're going to talk about the current scope of metabolic health and obesity in the United States, identify key mechanisms that help with insulin sensitivity, and we're, we're actually going to discuss several studies, but one in particular is ISOS. Um, for full disclosure, I have two podcasts, but one in particular, these are my podcast sponsors. I will not be talking about any products related to them, but wanted to be fully transparent. Um, weight does not equate with health. I've been a nurse practitioner for over 20 years, and I can tell you in the very beginning, I probably thought very differently, but I've learned um, appropriately over the last 25 years of being in healthcare that there's more to weight than meets the eye. Let's talk about the state of metabolic health. Less than 7% of the US population has good cardiometabolic health. And that's defined as normalized blood pressure, blood sugar, lipids, adiposity, which is fat, and absence of vascular disease. And the trends between 1999 and 2018 have worsened, especially in regards to fat and blood sugar levels. Fewer than one in 15 have optimal metabolic health. And that's from, the, that's from Jack, which is the Journal of American College of Cardiology. From the same study, this was 55,000 adults. The lead author said, we need a complete overhaul of our entire medical system, food system, and environment, because this is a crisis for everyone and not just one segment of the population. I can't agree with this statement more in cardiology, I worked in cardiology as an MP for 16 years. My patients continue to get sicker despite maximizing medical therapies. From the same study that actually came from Tufts University, they looked at these 55,000 patients, and it was interesting to look at the data from 10 years from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, and there were a lot of disparities between ethnicities, economically, and scholastic disparities. So it's something just to be considering how fortunate we are to be here today and learning this information, but there are many people at risk that may not even be aware of this. Obesity in general, it's tripled worldwide since 1975 from according to the World Health Organization. 39% of adults were overweight and 13% were obese. And in the United States, these figures suggest that 40% of adults are obese with the obesity rate in the 40 to 60 year old range, which is where I am now, exceeds 40%. The assumption is made that all obese people are insulin resistant or diabetic, and I'm here to argue that's not the case. So we have to define what actually constitutes metabolic health, and some of these things may be familiar to you in terms of vital signs, what's your blood pressure, um, you know, this labs, when, when your doctor, your nurse practitioner, your PA are looking at lipids and fasting blood sugar and fasting insulin and adiponectin if they're adding additional labs, the presence of abnormal liver function studies or evidence of a fatty liver on ultrasound or CT, or if you have a liver biopsy because you have significant um, liver disease, even DEXA scans, and we'll talk about this, or even this hyperinsulinemic clamp, which is kind of the gold standard. So as I was mentioning, these are some of the diagnostic options, and depending on the individual, depending on the clinician, they're probably gonna start with the low-lying fruit first. They're going to start with labs because that's a whole lot easier. Because of my copious amount of research, I included some labs that many of us are probably not as familiarized with. But looking at CAT scan information, DEXA scan, DEXA scans are not just looking at bone health or bone strength, they also can look at fat-free mass. 
and this gold standard, which is the insulin clamp. And I'm gonna actually show you a graphic in a second because I went down this rabbit hole of wanting to better understand how this works. So this is actually a glucose analyzer, and they're actually clamping the blood sugar, um, the in influx of this insulin. It's a steady state process, but it's looking how well your body's able to clear this over time. And you wanna really think, and you'll learn this from Dr. Gabrielle Lyon tomorrow, we wanna think about our muscles as one of the ways that we can dispose of blood sugar. Metabolic syndrome, I'm sure many of you are familiarized with this. Um, according to the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute and the NIH, if you have three or more of these, um, it will qualify or give you the diagnosis of metabolic syndrome. And so the most significant, based on the research that they shared, was waist circumference. So abdominal obesity for greater than 35 inches if you're a female, greater than 45 inches if you're male, high blood pressure, impaired fasting glucose of greater than 100, high triglycerides, which are defined as greater than 150, and a low HDL, which is gender dependent. And yet, interestingly enough, there is a metabolically healthy obese patient. Um, and based on all of the information I was looking at, it's a subcohort of patients with obesity not yet impacted by metabolic syndrome. They may have a reduced risk of type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, as well as all-cause mortality compared to their obese counterparts with insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome. And the criteria is really varied across studies with at least 30 different definitions that are applied in the literature, and the prevalence is estimated to be, wait for this, 6 to 75% of the obese population. And the data from the European Group for the Study of Insulin Resistance suggests that 25% of obese individuals with a BMI greater than 35 are insulin sensitive. This is quite significant. This is something that even for myself being well-versed in the literature, I was surprised to see. Again, the metrics are very different. You know, this, was, this slide is really depicting the data that I saw looking at several different studies. Most include, when they're looking at diagnostic criteria, they're looking at the usual suspects. They're looking at blood pressure, they're looking at, at labs. Um, less than half are using HOMA IR, which is looking specifically at fasting insulin and glucose. Um, less than third are actual diabetics. And fewer studies have used insulin sensitivity, which I think is the gold standard, um, comparing insulin sensitive obese to insulin sensitive, insulin resistant obese. And most studies actually use the HOMA IR. Some use smaller cohorts that use the gold standard, which is the hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp. But more often than not, it was blood work. OK. This is an overview before we get to studies. So predictors of the loss of insulin sensitivity over time. Most metabolically healthy obese with intermediate health risks so it could be that perhaps you have high blood pressure, maybe you have elevated triglycerides, will progress to the unhealthy category with time. An older age defined as greater than 50. Poor cardiometabolic risk at baseline. Also a lower HDL and elevated triglycerides. And more central adiposity, so those bigger, um, the bigger waist circumference, as well as having more ventral or obesity around your, your major abdomen. Uh, abdominal organs can be a larger risk factor. Insulin resistance, obviously. And it's interesting, there was a focus, the change in insulin resistance over time is key to determining the mechanism. So one thing that was important was to actually look at body composition, fat distribution. So fat on our butts is going to be less concerning than fat around our abdominal organs. Metabolic markers in a well phenotype cohort over five years. So let's get to some of the studies. So this first study, Insulin Sensitive Obesity from the American Journal of Physiology, Endocrinology, and Metabolism. This was looking at 60 morbidly obese men and women with a BMI at grade of 45 to 48, so these are morbidly obese, scheduled to undergo elective cholecystectomy, which means they remove the gallbladder, um, exploratory laparotomy, or gastric sleeve. They use the clamp, as I mentioned, that's kind of the typical gold standard. And they have use of BMI and match for age, sex, and body mass index into two groups, one that was insulin sensitive and one that was insulin resistant. And the inclusion criteria was their fasting glucose, A1C, and a stable weight. The exclusion criteria, which is quite extensive, medical history of, or family history of diabetes, high blood pressure, any acute inflammatory disease, cardiovascular disease, peripheral vascular disease, malignancy, which is cancer, 
thyroid disease, Cushing's, which is an adrenal issue, and obstructive sleep apnea. And at five out of 20 menopausal women were on no hormone replacement therapy, which we can discuss towards the end, can be very beneficial in helping to improve insulin sensitivity. And there were 16 premenopausal women who used oral contraceptives. So the results were as follows. Oops. Um, independent of body mass index, body fat mass, age and sex, they found more visceral fat and waist circumference in insulin resistant versus insulin sensitive patients. There was more liver fat in insulin resistance. You start to really recognize that with each one of these slides, we're really emphasizing specific key indicators that are determining whether or not someone's at greater risk to go on and develop insulin resistance. Um, for insulin resistant patients, they had higher blood sugar, A1C, fasting plasma insulin, triglycerides, um, as well as elevated liver function studies, lower HDL and higher high sensitivity CRP, which is again an inflammatory marker. For the insulin sensitive, they had higher adiponectin levels, which can help with satiety. They had low macrophage, which is this inflammatory infiltration in their fat, and higher circulating adiponectin, almost entirely predicting this insulin sensitive obese phenotype. Again, they have more circulating hormones that are telling their brains that they are full, as well as a change in the visceral fat versus the insulin sensitive obesity is mainly a phenotype, and I love this explanation in this study, is mainly a phenotype, meaning a physical manifestation found in premenopausal women who become insulin resistant after menopause. Now, I'm sure there are probably women in the audience saying that's kind of horrifying and scary, but we do know that, as an example, we know that estrogen can be this very much an insulin sensitizing hormone, and as we're losing our certain degree of insulin as it's fluctuating in perimenopause and in menopause, it can put us at greater risk, as well as this loss of muscle mass that goes on with age. There's another, um, another study, Insulin Sensitive Obesity in Humans, a Favorable Fat Phenotype. It was a review of 79 publications in the trends in endocrinology and metabolism, and it looked at insulin resistance arises when muscle cells become less able to use insulin and glucose in the blood. This is why when I'm talking to my patients, I tell them, take a walk after a meal. It is one of the most effective, um, helpful ways to bring your blood sugar down after eating a meal. And understanding that muscle is the primary organ of insulin sensitivity, north of 40, we are losing muscle mass with aging. It is a normal byproduct of aging, so you have to work against it. And helping, to, uh, helping patients, helping clinicians understand why it's so important to continue encouraging our patients to do strength training of some capacity, walk after meals, can have a huge net impact on whether or not they remain insulin sensitive. This is a great figure, and I'm sorry that I can't blow it up more, but it's really looking at, this is the body habitus of a more insulin sensitive patient. They have more aerobic fitness, so they're more physically active. They have less visceral adiposity, so less fat around their abdominal organs. They have less macrophage infiltration, which is talking about this inflammatory process. They have smaller adipocytes, which are fat cells. They have greater metabolic flexibility. Remember I was talking about muscle as this organ of longevity, how important it is to help with maintaining insulin sensitivity. They also have this lower skeletal muscle lipids. Um, they have lower inflammatory cytokines, which are these um, properties that, that go on that can drive um, fat deposition and inflammation in the body. They have this higher plasma adiponectin, which is that satiety hormone. They have lower liver fat. So if you've been told that you have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or novel D, that is a poor prognostic indicator. You want to ensure that your liver is not depositing all this additional fat. And it's interesting, I don't per se, disagree, I don't per se agree with this last one, lower dietary fat intake because everyone in this room knows that healthy fats are good for us. On this other slide, this is from Alice Tang's group, longitudinal changes in insulin resistance with normal weight, overweight, and obese individuals. They define metabolic health and obesity as a transient phenomenon diminishing with age. We know that that can change, right? That this is not a life sentence. This can be reversed. So it, there was a study from 2008 to 2010 it was only 99, so statistical significance usually want a study greater than 100. It was retrospective grouped into lean, BMI less than 25, 
overweight and obese with a BMI greater than 25, with the latter, the latter divided into insulin sensitive versus insulin resistant, again, based on the clamp. The main findings is that body mass index did not change over time, but the deposition of fat did. Remember I talked about like, women don't per se like having fat on their rear end. They don't per se want you know, all that, that fat, but the fat around our abdomens is the one that is the most problematic. And so blood pressure increased significantly in the insulin resistant, which is not surprising. And if you are at all familiar with Dr. Ben Bickman's work, he talks a great deal about how insulin resistance is at the basis of nearly every chronic metabolic disease that's out there. Okay. Um, the demographics in this group, median cohort was 49.8. I think I mentioned earlier, most of the cohorts to find older adults is greater than 50. Um, now that I'm of that age group, I, I always, disagree and think that doesn't sound pretty old at all to me. Um, the obese sensitive were younger than the obese resistant. That's important. There was no statistically significant fat or fat-free mass difference between the groups. Exclusion criteria. Listen to this exclusion criteria. I found this fascinating enough that I wanted to make a slide about it. They were excluded if they had had greater than a two kilogram weight change in six months. You know, one kilogram is 2.2 pounds. It's not a lot, right? Um, Self-reported regular physical activity. Um, treatment for medications that could lower their blood sugar. Known cardiac, renal, liver disease, or cancer, which makes sense. Those that were trying to conceive. Uh, consumption of a significant amount of alcohol on a daily basis. Smoking or non-diabetic confirmed by an oral glucose tolerance test. The predictors of insulin sensitivity, again, significant. Across large cohorts and longitudinal studies, younger age, defined as under than younger than 50. More physical activity, a degree of fasting and caloric restriction. Now, I talk a lot about intermittent fasting. It's probably what I'm probably best known for, but this is absolutely one of the things that helps with insulin sensitivity. If you do nothing else, eat less often to help preserve this insulin sensitivity. More peripheral fat distribution. Again, we don't like fat on our butt or our thighs, but it is much healthier than fat that is stored around our abdomens. And then also smaller adipocytes. Remember I talked about these fat cells. Also, low degree of liver steatosis. Remember we talked about fatty liver. Measured by CAT scan. And understanding that there's a role of healthy adipose tissue and better capacity to upregulate lipogenesis in liver, sorry, in adipose tissue that helps protect when we have this spillover into the muscle in insulin sensitive obese patients. So big takeaway, younger age, more physical activity, eating less often, um, you know, also just understanding that where you get your fat distribution has a large amount, a large impact on whether or not you remain insulin sensitive. Um, Okay, we talked about diagnostics, so clamp, DEXA, CAT scan. Don't go to your doctor and ask them to do a clamp. <laughs> Much more likely they'll start with a DEXA, they'll start with lab work. Those are inexpensive tests. If you need to have a CAT scan because there's some concern about whether or not you have fatty liver or nofl D, that's different. You're probably in a university setting if you're getting a clamp. Okay, we touched on this. Sorry, I think I have a double slide. Okay, so predictors of insulin resistance. I have two back-to-back -back slides. I'm actually gonna use this one because it's better. Predictors of future insulin resistance. Sarcopenic obesity. Maybe for some of you who've never heard the term sarcopenia, it is muscle loss with aging. It is not an if, a question of if, it is a question of when. We should be working in our 20s and 30s to help maintain as much muscle mass as we can because our muscles are this glucose disposal unit. They have a great deal of impact on whether or not we remain insulin sensitive throughout our lifetime. How many of my female patients that are in 50s and 60s and they want to just do cardio? Or how many gentlemen out there just want to do cardio and not lift weights? I tell them all the time, you're not going to get huge. It's not going to happen. But it's very, very important to build and maintain muscle mass. In this, there was a large cohort of non-obese and obese men. The proportion of muscle mass to body weight was significantly elevated in men with obesity who remained metabolically healthy over four years. Same was found for men and women who were non-obese, but not in women with obesity. Ladies, unfortunately, <laughs> where our gender can sometimes be problematic, and this is definitely one of those things where it's super important to understand the significance of making sure that we are building and maintaining muscle. Skeletal muscle, big takeaway, is the primary tissue determining whole body insulin, excuse me, whole body insulin resistance. 
Big takeaway, gotta make sure you're, you're lifting weights or you're doing some strength training or body weight exercises, irrespective of life, what life stage you are at. Again, visceral fat, waist circumference, again, another big takeaway, waist circumference, body mass index, liver fat, but BMI and liver fat together suggest a future prediction of a loss of metabolic health over time. Everyone in this room should have a sense of what your fasting insulin is. It's one of these conversations I have with patients almost every single day or discussions on social media. It's cheap, it's inexpensive, you can trend it over time. Um, it's one of the markers that I think is most beneficial and it oftentimes dysregulates years before you'll see blood sugar or A1C becoming abnormal. In ISOS, which we'll talk about, visceral fat, waist circumference, BMI, and liver fat were the most significant predictors of insulin resistance in the future. There are also some gender differences. Remember, I spoke about this in the very beginning. Insulin sensitivity differs between men and women. Men have more muscle mass on their bodies than women do. And that has a lot to do with the fact that women, up until they go through menopause, their bodies are designed to procreate, create life, carry life. They are going to have more, um, they're gonna have definitely more adipose tissue. Despite having a lower fat mass, the prevalence of diabetes and early abnormal glucose metabolism are more common in men than women up until menopause. Women are at a lowered risk to fatty acid-induced peripheral insulin resistance up until menopause. And in some instances, because I'm so well vested in the research about perimenopause and menopause for women in particular, there is a role, as I mentioned earlier, about um, estrogen providing some degree of help with insulin sensitivity. We know testosterone is an example. In many in instances with men, it's not optimized because they're insulin resistant, because they're, expo they're exposed to endocrine mimicking chemicals in the environment, in their personal care products, food, et cetera. And women, in many instances, are um, at this advantage until they go into menopause, when they, unless they're uh, taking hormone replacement therapy, many women will really struggle. They'll say, I know I, I did really well, and all of a sudden I developed this weight loss resistance, and I'm struggling with now becoming insulin resistant. And a lot of it has to do with these hormonal fluctuations. During menopause, changes in estrogen and testosterone are associated with a loss of subcutaneous fat and a gain of visceral fat and an increase in insulin resistance. I was reading some statistics that the average woman, again, average, that means more will gain, there are some that will gain more, some will gain less, 10 pounds in the first two to three years of menopause. Menopause is defined as 12 months without a menstrual cycle. Men do, do go through andropause, but it's not nearly as dramatic. Now, when I think about the things that are key takeaways, I didn't create a slide talking about lifestyle, but I think it's important to emphasize the things that will really help you with maintaining insulin sensitivity. First and foremost is sleep. How many of us take for granted that we get six hours a night of sleep, seven hours of sleep a night, and the net impact on our blood sugar is quite significant. Even one day of less than six hours a night of sleep has a significant impact on blood sugar regulation. So getting high quality sleep, irrespective of your gender, what life stage you're in, needs to be paramount. It is foundational to our health. Number two is stress management. You know, there's a key hormone, a stress response hormone called cortisol. When cortisol goes up, whether it's because you yelled at a spouse, we've just been through the years of a pandemic, you're separated from your loved ones, you go through a divorce, you lose a job, all of a sudden, your insulin's up, or excuse me, your, your cortisol goes up, your blood sugar goes up correspondingly, it's a sympathetic nervous system response. What do you think happens when your blood sugar goes up, your insulin goes up? What happens if your insulin goes up and remains up? You are never gonna be, you're gonna have trouble accessing fat, stored fat for energy. And you're not going to be looking for broccoli and chicken. You're gonna be looking for junk. And so just to be cognizant of the fact, the role of sleep and stress, also thinking about macros. You know, this is a low carb event. I'm a huge proponent of protein and healthy fats. And if you are already insulin resistant or diabetic, you've got to lower that carbohydrate threshold. It's really critically important. I think that you know when I look at the research and I think about the things that are most impactful, all of a sudden changing your relationship with protein so you're staying satiated is so, so important. I cannot underestimate how many women come into my practice, they're eating 40 grams of protein a day, 50, and when they start increasing at 75, 80, 90, 100 grams of protein, their satiety mechanisms are better regulated in the body. Same thing goes for men as well, but I work predominantly with women, so that's always the case example that I use. The other thing is fasting. Even if you don't technically fast, 12 hours of digestive rest, 
What do you think happens every time that you consume, every single time that you are consuming food? And depending on the type of macronutrient you're consuming, if you just have plain carbs, you're gonna have a greater or more exaggerated blood sugar response and corresponding insulin response than if you would if you were just having protein or healthy fats. And so really understanding that you can maximize the quality of carbohydrates you're consuming from non-starchy vegetables if you do consume them, hitting those protein macros, being very cognizant of that, but also eating less often, giving yourself at least 12 hours of digestive rest. Now, if you're a woman that's still getting your menstrual cycle, understanding there's fasting that's specific to that, um, men and menopausal women have a much easier time, much easier time. There's less hormonal fluctuation. So I hope that you have you know, understood that there are some key mechanisms that we really want to lean into, things that you can be talking to your doctor, your NP, your PAs about, things that you can be changing. You know, I know this, this very last slide is about um, the key takeaways, but really understand there's lots of things you can do. I would say lastly, it's finding things that bring you joy in your life. We know that oxytocin is a hormone that helps reduce cortisol. Cortisol goes down, blood sugar goes down, insulin levels are going to be improved. Finding things that bring you joy. If the last three years have taught us nothing, I think it's a really beautiful opportunity to say yes to things that work for us, say no to things that don't, spend time with people that we love. All of those things can drive a lot of improvement, not only in our metabolic health, but also our insulin sensitivity. Thank you.